Hey, good morning, Monstropolis. It's now 5 after the hour of 6 a.m. in the big monster city. Come on! Let's get pumped! I'm not drinking any fucking Merlot! What can I say? The camera loves me. Shall we begin? After you, Junior. Gosh, I love that intro. Uh, anyway, uh, welcome back to Multiplex Vlog. This, uh, this should be a fun episode. These are movies uh, that you need that require more than one watch. These are ones the first watch just ain't gonna cut it. Uh, for whatever reason, just second watch is welcome. Uh, we got a great panel of uh, pretentious douchebags to help us out tonight. Uh, of first, course, Caleb up, Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> first up, uh, returning guest on the show, Mr. Scott Harvey. Scott, I think this is your second time being on an actual episode of Logged It, not one where we went to a different dimension, but I might be wrong. Yeah. Might be third, might be third, but yeah, no, I am happy to be here. I signed up for this one last time I was on, and it was mentioned, oh, hey, this is going to be a future topic. And yeah, I guess being the pretentious douchebag I, I am, I was like, hey, that, that sounds like fun. Um, so yeah. This is one of the few topics where basically a lot of people signed up like pretty far in advance, which is unusual for this show. So mm -hmm. good on all three of you for doing that. Kudos. Uh, Spence. Uh, you exist. Uh, I, I feel like you as a person require like multiple efforts. So I feel like <laughs> I was never... just telling someone that today. So you're right. <laughs> uh, this is actually my sixth time on the show. So I'm nice and comfortable here. Uh, but you know what? I'm My goal here is not to be comfortable. It's to make Caleb Boatman uncomfortable. And I'm looking forward to doing that today. That is fair. Uh, that is <laughs> not something that is difficult to do. Uh, other things that make Caleb Boatman uncomfortable, Cody Newberry, bugs, and uh, being told I have to talk to a human woman. Uh, and <laughs> Dylan, <laughs> Dylan, you're here tonight. How are you feeling? I'm doing well. Uh, I'm going on not very much sleep, so hopefully I can be as lively as possible. But yeah, this should be fun. That's fair. Okay. So we're going to get started with uh, the way we always start this episode, uh, start this show. What was your favorite movie you logged this week? Let's talk about some good things we did this week. Uh, I will start uh, us off. I haven't, in terms of what I've logged, I haven't logged a lot of great movies. I logged a lot of crap. But there was one movie I watched last week, exactly on Tuesday, that I had a really good time with. And uh, time, no time with, I should say, because it, it, it's no time to die. That's, that's the one. Uh, <laughs> that was like, anyway, no time to die. I'm not like the biggest James Bond guy. I like James Bond. I'm not even the biggest like Craig era James Bond guy. I don't like love Skyfall like some people do. I like it. I just don't like love. I don't have this attachment for the Craig era. It's a four-star movie. Give me a break. Um, anyway, I was really impressed with No Time to Die. I think it, like, leaned back into, like, some classic Bond tropes while also, like, very much, like, expanding the universe. And I, I was just very impressed with it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Scott, you see uh, No Time to Die yet? Yeah, I did. Um, I... You know, was building up to this one by rewatching a lot of the Bond movies, including the Craig ones. And I'm going to be honest, by the time I got to No Time to Die, I was dreading it because uh, Spectre for me is just absolute dog crap. And then um, knowing that this one was going to be two hours and 45 minutes or something, I was like, oh, man, this is going to be tough. But I did enjoy it about as much as I was going to. Um, it's not amazing or anything for me. It's not one of the best Bond movies. Um but I was rarely bored. I was bored less than I expected to be. Um, I think there's a lot of fun stuff in it. I think Ana de Armas is great and should have been in more of the movie. Um, I found her more compelling like sidekick than Lashana Lynch's character um, was for Bond. Um, villain was a little weak. 
Um, it, this is like the one movie where I actually wanted them to let Rami Malek do the overacting that he does in every other movie. And instead, they just have him be like really sullen and like one note for the whole time. So that was kind of disappointing. But uh, I do I do really like the way that the whole arc that they have been creating for Bond throughout all of the Craig movies it comes to it comes to an end. Like, I think the way that they it pays off in the end and the theme of Bond being sort of a screw up over the course of these movies. I think that that pays off in a really satisfying way. So I am positive on the movie, which I was not expecting to be. Uh, Adelaide. I almost brought it up this week because you know what? It's that damn good. As someone who likes Bond even less than Caleb Oatman, but likes Spectre more than uh, Scott Harvey. I think I'm like in the middle of most people. People are called, or actually no, I think I'm on the higher end. For me, it's my, it's my second favorite Bond film, having not seen a lot of them and probably not liking the ones I haven't seen. It's a really fucking good time. Malik's probably the worst part of the movie, but when an Oscar winner who's hamming it up as like a fun-ish villain is your worst part, that's a good fucking movie. Uh, Dylan, you seen this one yet? I have actually. Uh, I saw it. I think the week it came out, and honestly, I think I'm more on Scott's side. I think it was, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I definitely think it. I did feel the length, like towards the end, like especially. I saw it at a later screening, and it was really, really hard to stay awake. Uh, but no, I enjoyed it overall. I think for. I think Craig's Bond gets a lot of like uh, crap from certain people who think that it's too these like too serious or the movies like aren't fun enough. And I think this one actually finds a pretty good balance of like the goofier aspects of Bond while also being having like the seriousness and being like a good send off to the to the character. So yeah, That's I like fair. that. Okay, uh, Scott, we're gonna go to you. What was your favorite movie log this week? Uh, so there was a movie that came out this weekend. I don't know if anyone heard about it. Uh, it's called Ron's Gone Wrong. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it was actually Dune. Uh, I saw Dune like a lot of people did. Um, watched it in IMAX on Friday. Um, I don't, I'm not a person who's like, oh, I have to go see every big movie in IMAX or whatever, even though like I guess I could through my AMC stubs. But um, I knew that this is one where you have to have the experience. And yeah, I, I would highly recommend seeing this in as enhanced a format as you can, uh, because it is one of the most impressive spectacles I've ever seen on the big screen. Um, and, you know, in that IMAX with especially the sound design, like it just like overwhelms you um, at times. And and honestly, like the movie, uh, I I'm not a Dune, like, I didn't know anything about Dune going in. I was a complete Dune virgin going in. And so I was like, you know, I, I heard all of what everyone was saying, like, oh, this is, you know, such an impenetrable, like, un, unfilmable, unadaptable thing. Um, and I was like, am I really going to, you know, get involved with this? And yeah, like, it is impossible to look away from this movie, um, regardless of whether um, you're, you're familiar with Dune or not. I um, just found this incredibly um mesmerizing obviously on the technical level like i said like there's just stuff you've never seen before like the way that the sand like vibrates and moves on screen is like just crazy uh, i literally was like wow out loud in the theater multiple times and i think the story is good enough to keep the momentum going when the spectacle does um recede and honestly as you know comp complex as dune is i wasn't really lost um in the story despite no not knowing anything going in I think the whole cast is really great. Rebecca Ferguson is excellent. Um, and I can't wait for part two, and now it's happening. So, uh, yeah, this gets the highest recommendation possible for me. I loved it. Uh, Spence, you seen Dune yet? I saw it an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> it is it good? Yes. And everyone overhyping the fuck out of it? Absolutely. Uh, it's just it's frustrating to want to see a movie and to be like, oh, I'm excited for this, and everyone call it the greatest thing to ever walk the face of the planet. Okay, expectations are here, and as much as I'd like to set myself aside from that, it's basically impossible for me. So when it didn't meet those expectations, I'm like, oh, I'm a little underwhelmed. Even beyond that, I think uh, it's not a very emotional story, which I like my which I like my films to be more often than not, uh, and it, it's a little distant. But I still think it's like an incredible achievement, and I'm really excited for part two. I think I'm gonna like part two more than this, just theoretically. But if people could like talk about it less hyperbolically for the next year, be great. Otherwise, it's gonna start going down and down. Like I have shut up. 
Uh, I haven't seen Dune yet. Uh, I have, I have just been very like underwhelmed with everything I've seen, and honestly, even what I've heard has just been like, eh, this feels like a movie I'm not going to like, and then people are going to be mad at me for not liking it, and like. So yeah, I'm I'm not excited for Dune. I'll watch it eventually, but like, nah. Dylan. No, I haven't gotten the chance to see it either, but I am actually very excited for it. I'm I'm a huge fan of Denis Villeneuve and of the films that I've seen from him so far. And uh, yeah, just plans haven't aligned, unfortunately, for me to see it yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. That's fair. Okay, uh, Spence, we'll go to you. What is your favorite movie you love this week? Uh, as the expert on classics here, I'm going to pick the oldest film mentioned so far. A film from that very ancient year none of us were alive for, 1990. Uh, a great little rom-com by the name of Pretty Woman. Uh, is it an amazing, perfect film that should win all the Oscars? No. Which it, it fulfills every everything a general rom-com needs. Funny characters. You like the shit going on, stars a couple hot people, and you know what? There's a good romance there. That's all that I need. It's all that I need. Richard Gere and Julie Roberts are fantastic. Uh, fucking Jason Alexander, he's a little shithead. I love when he gets his shit pushed in. Like, it's just a fun, nice, relaxing afternoon <laughs> movie. <laughs> it, it's, it's all of my four quadrants met. It's not perfect. I'm never going to be like, if you don't like this, you're a bitch. Unless your camera holds with me. Fuck you, you should like it more. But uh, I think it's a really good time, and everyone should watch it. Yeah, I, this is a movie that exists. I think it's fine. I It's, a, it's like a three-star movie. It's... It's fine. Julie Roberts, I actually stand by. Like, this is one of, if not her best performance as an actress. Uh, she's actually really good in this. I like the cast. It's just, I think Gary Marshall is a very mediocre director, just like in general. Uh, but I, the thing I will give this movie soundtrack slaps. Yeah. The soundtrack to this movie actually rocks. Uh, King of Wishful Thinking uh, is like top tier, like underrated origi- underrated-ish for original songs from movies. Yeah. Uh, Scott, thoughts on Pretty Woman? Haven't seen it. Uh, I'm actually kind of surprised that Spence likes this movie. It seems like something that like has not aged very well at all. At least that's that's kind of my impression of it. But um, yeah, I mean, I'd give it a shot. I, I, you know, just never one that has really jumped out to me. Dylan? You, you like seem like a big Pretty Woman guy, yeah, Dylan. <laughs> Yeah, unsurprisingly, I actually haven't seen it either. So <laughs> That's fair. Okay, well, Dylan, we're going to stick with you. What was your favorite movie log this week? Well, going back even further into the annals of history uh, to the year 1980, uh, recently today I just watched the movie Kagemusha by Akira Kurosawa. And this is a movie that I've kind of been putting off for a long time just because of its runtime. Uh, but I really, really loved it. And it's like whenever I put on a Kurosawa movie, even though they're all like, most of them, at least the epics are like super, super long. I always find myself surprised by how like quickly they move for me. And like this one, basically what it's about is it's like this warlord who's like, he knows that he's near the end of his death. So he recruits like a thief who looks exactly like him. And they're both played by Tetsuya Nakadai. Uh, basically, gives him an ultimatum like, hey, we'll kill you unless you uh, agree to imitate me after I die and become basically like the new uh, warlord, but just to like pretend that he is him and not actually do anything just so that to pr- they think that he's still alive and enemies don't like attack. Uh, and it's really like morally complex because only a handful of people know that he is not who he says he is and it's really interesting just seeing how this all like weighs in weighs on the character morally and yeah I just I love how Akira Kurosawa like he never he's not a director to like tell you how to think or what to feel he just like presents the characters how they are and I think this movie is really great and it's probably him at his most haunting uh, visually I'd say so yeah recommend I have seen a total of two Akira Kurosawa movies. This isn't one of them. Scott. 
I've seen a total of one. Um, I definitely want to get more into his movies. Like it was a big blind spot for me until this year. And then I watched high and low, which is the one that I have seen and it was incredible. So um, it's, you know, a plan for whenever I have time to actually just sit down and watch movies for fun. Um, I definitely want to get into some others, but I haven't got to this one yet. Actually, I've seen Rashomon too. So I, I've seen three Akira Kurosawa movies. Uh, Spence. Hey, Dylan. Take your morally complex movies. Get out of here. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen what it. What is this? Sh- the ep- topic of this show, Spence. Yeah, I, 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 we'll, we'll okay, see. Okay, moving on to <laughs> your least favorite movie along this week. We'll start with Scott this time. Scott, what do you hate today? Um, well, I wouldn't say I hate it, but it's definitely my least favorite movie that I watched in the last week. I've been trying to cross off a couple of horror blind spots with it being October. I've never seen a Friday the 13th movie. Um, so I watched the first one over the weekend. Quite enjoyed it, actually. Uh, I know a lot of people are not high on the original, but I liked it quite a bit. Then I watched the second one, which is what I'm picking. Um, it's fine. It's definitely not as good as the first movie, and it is definitely heavily a retread of the first movie. Down to, well, number one, the movie opens with like a seven minute, like previously on Friday the 13th, like dream sequence where the main character just like relives the, well, the final girl from the last movie just like relives the entire last segment of the first movie. But then they just like mimic so much of the first movie down to like the very ending. With, which, like, the best moment in the first movie is that shot of Jason coming out of the water um, at the end when, you know, she's in the canoe. And they do, like, the exact same thing. They even have, like, the exact music playing when the final girl or whatever is, like, in the house. And it's like, oh, they're safe or whatever. You think that they've defeated Jason. And then he jumps through the window and grabs her. So it just felt like a little stale for me. Uh, I know some of the other sequels are supposed to be more fun. I do plan to watch those at some point. And this one at least does have Jason running around with a bag on his head, which was kind of a comical image, but um, not a great movie. If I'm being honest, I think this one is basically on par with the first one, but I was very unimpressed with the first one. So take with that what you will. Uh, this, I, I actually kind of like the setup of this movie of like a camp that is being built like, away from Crystal Lake, but, like, it's still kind of there. I don't know. I think they're... I also just kind of like the characters a little bit more in this one than I do in the first one. I think they're still not great. Like, they're Friday the 13th characters. I I think I like this one a little bit more than the first one, but basically in terms of quality, they're the same movie, in my opinion. Uh, Dylan, uh, have you seen part two? I have, actually. I also saw it pretty recently because I've been going through the movies. Uh, I actually feel the opposite the way of uh, Scott. I think the first one is very, very boring. And I think this one is like, there's look, there's like a really low bar for these movies, like if we're being honest. And I feel like the second one, at least it's like fun and it starts moving in the direction of I, that I like the franchise with where it just embraces like the silly campiness, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's still not, in my opinion, like one of the best best of the franchise that's fair uh spence i'm just really frustrated that scott keeps fighting being a fandom player when today alone he said he's watched all of the bond movies and two friday movies which is more than most fandom players so if you want to team, you'll bring me <laughs> but see it's the, other, it's the other it's the other topics that we don't want to broach it's the other hey if you like star wars talk to scott like harvey it. he needs you <laughs> Anyway, uh, so now we'll go to me. Uh, Worst movie I watched this week. Speaking of fandom movies, look, this movie has one. I'll be honest. There's a reason this I gave this movie one and a half stars, and it's purely because of one song. Wake me up. Wake me up. I can't wake up. <laughs> Daredevil is garbage. But bring it proved to me that "Bring Me to Life" by Evanescence is one of the greatest songs of all time because it got me hyped in an awful movie. Like that scene is objectively terrible, but that song just makes anything look awesome. You could you could literally just 
have me existing, one of the least awesome people of all time, and play bring me to life around me, it would look like the coolest thing ever. Anyway, Daredevil sucks. Uh, it's it's bad in a very like early two thousands like meh, like Nickelback Creed. Let's just be all moody and poop uh, kind of way that I hate. Like there there's a strong difference between like bad nineties comic book movie and bad two thousands comic book movie. And I'll take bad 90s comic book movie any day of the week because those are at least a fun kind of bad, whereas bad 2000s comic book movies are just so moody and depressing and whiny. Uh, the I will say, I did die laughing during the uh, playground fight sequence, which is a thing I had never seen in full. I know it's kind of infamous, but I don't think I've ever seen it because then. That scene is amazing. Uh, in a bad way, uh, but overall, uh, uh, you know what? Personal, I'll give a shout out to Joey Pants. Joey Pants is great and everything. He's actually real fun in this. Uh, Dylan, you seem like you're like this big like comic book movie guy. Uh, have you seen Daredevil? No, because I've only heard bad things, so <laughs> not super. Good exciting. life choices. I, I, you're you're doing well. Uh, Adelaide, it was. I so don't hard. think you Oh, you've seen Daredevil? It was so hard to not start playing Bring Me to Life while you were talking. You don't want to get copyright to... strike or else I would have told That's you. why I didn't. <laughs> uh, I've seen the Nostalgia Critic review of this, and that's all that I need to answer baseline plot level questions in Phantom. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, Scott? I saw it a long time ago. I don't remember that much about it. To be honest, I would probably like it a little bit because I do like the early 2000s comic book movies like that's kind of like the era for me when a lot of stuff came out that i like although i'm sure that this movie probably doesn't hold up great i do remember the scene where they kiss in the rain though and i actually thought that that was a kind of a nice scene um at the time when i watched it but that was a long time ago all right uh adelaide what was your least favorite movie you like this week before this air before this started taping i asked bowman hey can i cheat because i don't normally watch bad movies but I actually did recently, because I, I took a trip to California <laughs> to see my partner. And no movie. It's like, oh, yeah, so let's, see, let's see what's on TV. There is a marathon of this great little, this great little trilogy y'all might now call The Descendants. Uh, it's about the, the sons and daughters of Disney characters. And you know what? It's three films about a bunch of villains' kids trying to fuck a half-furry boy. And I hated them all. Uh, namely the second one. Because if you guys watch Ant Farm... Uh, China Ann McClan, China Ann McClane, who released a great song called uh, "Calling Out, Calling All the Monsters," which is a Halloween banger. Uh, she's Ursula's daughter, and the whole thing is just ooh, she has blue hair. She must be a squid lady, and then she gets really mad that she can't like marry the son of Beast and take over the good kingdom because then there's good and evil segregation in this movie, fucking apparently, and then she becomes like a squid. It's awful. I hate every second of it. Uh, kill me now. You see, my problem isn't that this was like two weeks ago. My problem is that this is a TV movie. But whatever. Okay, uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice is mediocre. There you go. Okay, never mind. We're coming to something. <laughs> um, I will accept no besmirching of Jay Baruchel dressing exactly the same way I do for two hours. What do you mean anyway, like, I talk to you enough? <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm not 14. I haven't watched a Descendants movie. Uh, I'm going to assume Scott and Dylan aren't like big Descendants guys. No, but I no, do want to give. I do want to thank Adelaide for the blast for the blast to the past a little bit there with the uh, reference to Ant Farm and calling all the monsters that. Ant Farm was a great song, was genuinely like the greatest show ever. Not really, but it felt like it at the time. I will say too that we always talk about on these shows. I feel like somebody selling us or not selling us on a movie being good. Spence definitely sold me on this movie being bad. So <laughs> there's credit <laughs> okay. there. Uh, so, uh, Dylan, what, what's your crap today? 
Yeah, so I'll be a little quicker because I think this was brought up past on previous episodes, but I've been going through the Saw franchise just to catch up on scary movies that I hadn't seen before. And it culminated in me watching Spiral, which kind of was fighting an uphill battle for me already because I think my least favorite part of the Saw franchise would be like the police procedural aspects. Not that that not that I think that's like a bad idea to have a police procedural set in this universe, but they haven't really found a way to make it interesting in my opinion. And yeah, Chris Rock is just very miscast. I don't think he's very convincing as this like cynical, jaded police officer. So yeah, the movie just didn't work for me. I didn't see Saw and I didn't see Spiral. (laughs) Uh, Scott. Uh, so I recently played somebody in trivia. He used Saw as a strength. Um, and so I made it through Saw 5, and then I had had enough. I, I actually did not mind the first three, uh, to my surprise, but it fell off very quickly after that, so I've not seen Spiral. Uh, Adelaide? I didn't Saw this movie. I already made a similar joke. That's illegal. I don't listen to what you say. That's fair. Okay, now we're going to go to our watch list. Dylan, what's the movie out of your watch list that you're excited about? Uh, yeah, so the movie that I added, uh, a movie that came out earlier this year was uh, Psycho Gorman. And it, a mo- the movie that I'm adding to my list today is by the same people, Astron 6. They, did a pr- they previously did a movie called The Editor, which is basically like paying homage to like old Italian giallo horror movies, and it sounds pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to checking that one out. It's fair, Spence. Sorry, I asked you for my what I added or my or my thoughts on what Dylan said. What you added? Oh, okay. So there's a there's a there's a movie coming out this year, which is Romeo and Juliet, which is whatever. Uh, but it stars my future ex-wife uh, Jesse Buckley, so I had to support it as my watch list. Very excited to watch it. It's fair, uh, Scott. Uh, isn't it like a filmed play or is it an actual movie? I don't fucking know. I, 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 animals okay. in the top 100, it counts. Um, so actually, just before this, I when I was watching our movie of the month, I added another film starring Brooke Adams, who is the lead actress in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, um, which I've never seen before for some reason, and that's Days of Heaven, the Terrence Malick um, movie. I... I've never gotten into Terrence Malick, but I feel like maybe with a 98-minute running time, uh, that might be the the ticket for me. So we'll see. Terrence Malick's first two movies are like really short, which is weird for Malick. And I then he to took watch. like 20 years off, and he came back and started making like three three hour. I'm movies. convinced Terrence Malick is actually two people. He that's why he's like so coy about doing interviews. He's actually two people. Theory confirmed. Uh, anyway. Uh, movie I added. Five people. Uh, a movie I added to my watch list that I'm excited about. Uh, this is I literally know nothing about this film other than Bob Hoskins is in it, and Barr just gave it a four and a half out of five on Letterbox. It's called The Long Good Friday. I don't know what it is, but I'm I'm gonna watch it now. Uh, so yeah, now. We go to the main thingy of the show, the meat and potatoes, the the cheesecake with whipped cream. I'm running out of analogies. Anyway, these are movies that you need to watch twice. Scott, I'll let you start. All right, I'll start things off with probably a predictable pick for me. Uh, and I think maybe just one of the most quintessential movies when you think of a movie that you need to watch twice, at least in the sense of you need to watch it twice to understand what is everything that is going on. And you still probably won't understand it on a second watch, but it's still one of my favorite movies. Mulholland Drive uh, by David Lynch. Um, yeah, like I, I, I start to tell people who haven't seen this, like don't even like attempt to try and like, put everything together when you first watch it because it's just not going to happen um you know you'll probably go down some youtube rabbit holes after you watch the movie and that's totally fine i think that's totally justified with this movie but i think it's just more of an experience and david lynch has kind of said so himself it's more about just kind of letting it wash over you and i i like like the mystery of trying to figure it out even if there's not like a clear answer at the end although i think there is an interpretation that more or less makes sense as much as the movie is going to but um it's a incredible tale 
uh, incredibly atmospheric tale. Like it is just amazingly unsettling in the way that Lynch is able to, he makes like these environments, like there's just one or two things that are just slightly off about them. Not in a way that is like overwhelmingly like, Oh, something is weird. Weird is going on here, but it's like, this face that someone is making doesn't make sense or something in this environment doesn't quite make sense. Like it is, it is, it makes you feel like you are in a dream more effectively than any movie that I've seen before. Um, because that's like in a dream. It's like, it's not like, well, sometimes people have really weird dreams, but a lot of times it's just like, this person shouldn't be in this place. Um, it's just like these slight little things that don't make sense. Um, but the mystery is great. Naomi Watts just gives uh, an all-time performance, in my opinion. Um, there's like two layers to it. Um, and I think the movie is ultimately, at least for me, the theme I resonate with is like um, the way that Hollywood kind of uses up female actresses in the industry after they reach a certain age um, and, you know, kind of cast them aside. I think that's the part that really resonates for me. But there's so much going on here. It's an amazing movie. Yeah, I like Mul Mulholland Drive. I think the fact that I don't love Mulholland Drive, you can maybe contribute to the fact that I've only seen it once. Uh, but I'll be honest, I just haven't really had a desire to... It didn't give me enough to like go off of character-wise that I feel like I had a desire to rewatch it. Uh, Adelaide. David Lynch is maybe like the least me director, so I don't know if I'll ever watch this. Uh, don't. Yeah, I mean, David Lynch is one of my favorite directors, mainly just because I love how committed he is to just, like, making movies in his way and just, like, not giving in to, like, revealing what his movies are about. Because oftentimes I feel like answers and knowing exactly what's going on can kind of make the movie a little less interesting with these types of movies. Like, for, uh, I recently rewatched uh, I'm Thinking of Ending Things, knowing exactly what's supposed to be happening. And I do think it became a slightly less interesting of a narrative. So I love how his movies are just kind of like puzzle boxes with no specific like answer. And you're supposed to come to the conclusions yourself. And this one's really good. I would have probably went with Eraserhead, but that's just me. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, well, now we'll go to me for my first pick. Uh, I don't know if I love a lot of these, like, oh, you need to see this one twice because there's, like, so much. So I, I don't love a lot of the more surrealistic films. Uh, so this was a kind of an interesting topic for me. But I'm going with one where I think just a movie where the ending changes so much about the rest of the movie that a second watch is necessary. And I'm going with Vertigo. I think Vertigo is a movie that I did not really like on first watch. I thought it was like lower tier Hitchcock the first time I saw it. But the second time I watched it was when it really kind of all came together for me. Because I, I'm i weird in that I, I, a lot of people don't like, don't agree with me on this. I don't really, I didn't, when I first watched it, I didn't like like the first half of Vertigo. Uh, but now that I've like given it a rewatch, uh, I think that the first half works a lot better. I always thought the first half was kind of boring first time I watched it. Uh, but now I think the first half works in uh, addition to the second half. So I just think there's a, a lot going on in terms of like, you can see a lot more of like the hints in terms of like the reveal beforehand. And you can also kind of get more of the sense of what uh, Scotty is like actually going through mentally throughout this movie. And I think that's really interesting. Dylan thoughts on Vertigo. Oh, I love Vertigo. I, I actually have only seen this the one time though, but I, so I haven't gotten the experience yet of rewatching it, knowing where like the movie ends. Uh, but yeah, I really like it uh, a lot. It's just, been, it's been a while since I've seen it. So some of the parts of it are kind of hazy in my mind. That's fair. Uh, Dylan? Or I just said Dylan. I laid... This is a really good movie. Uh, I I don't agree with your sentiment of... like. I don't think this needs a second viewing, per se. I think I enjoyed it the same amount the first time that I will the second time. Uh, I don't, like, fight having a good movie on the list. Uh, I, know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have good movies. But uh, this is it. Eh. Good movie. Yeah. It's fair. Scott? Fantastic movie, one of Hitchcock's 
objectively best, although it doesn't quite reach the top of my favorites list. Uh, yeah, and I think most of his movies could po possibly fall into this camp because he's such a master craftsman that you know there are things going on there in the first half that, um, you know, you, you just don't pick up on the first time because you're just trying to follow the story. Um, so, yeah, great movie and very terrifying to me because I'm also severely afraid of heights. So um, the all the scenes in the clock tower are yeah, un uh, upsetting for me. That is fair. Uh, Dylan, we're going to go to you. Yeah, well, since we're talking about, like, these kind of, like, head-trippy uh, movies that can often be a little confusing, I think uh, the list would be un incomplete without uh, a entry from A24, so I'm going with the movie that I'm very obsessed with uh, called The Lighthouse, which I probably have I probably like way more than any, everyone else on this call here, but I just really love this movie and I get a lot out of it from rewatching it. And cause there's like so many different, like there's so much going on and so much that you can take from it. Like which parts you think are real, which parts are, which parts do you pick up on as being like references to other, there's like a lot of references to like mythology and stuff like that, like Prometheus and Proteus. And yeah, I just, I, also, I mean, uh, none of this would really matter if the movie just wasn't entertaining enough to make you want to come back uh, to rewatch it again and pick up new stuff, which I think is where I differ from the opinion for a lot of people, because a lot of people think this movie is just straight up slow and boring. And I'm like, I respect your opinion, but what the heck? Like, this movie is so much fun, in my opinion. Like, I love how, like, Robert Eggers completely leans into, like, sort of the inherent humor of that would come from this situation of these two guys just being locked together and absolutely hating each other and not really warming up to each other at all really and so there's a lot of humor that comes from that that i find it really entertaining and yeah this is just a movie that i really really love for some reason that's fair uh adelaide no uh, I I do not fucking get this movie. Pace needs to calm down in the chat. This is... I won't say it's nonsensical. I just think tonally it's just hard to get into. And the narrative is... I get why it's on this show. I think it's a movie that'll never work for me, and I'm surprised it works, period. Uh, other than, like, the homoerotic subtext and the weird... The meaningness of it with, like, the hark and the fucking seagull. I think, like, it's there. I think there's better A24 movies to pick. I just, I don't get this at all. It's fair. Uh, Scott? This is probably going to surprise some people. I've still not seen The Lighthouse. Um, that I, yeah, I love The Witch. I, I, I really do. And when this came out, I had every intention of seeing it. But I don't know, 2019 had a lot of incredible movies come out. I think maybe it just got lost in the mix for me at the time it came out. And after the fact, I did hear that there's uh, quite a lot of uh, flatulence-based humor in the movie, which is not my favorite brand of humor. So that has discouraged me from seeing it a little bit. That's fair. Uh, well, Adelaide, we will go to you for your first pick. Uh, I'm going to be a somewhat non-traditional, because I feel like with Scott and Dylan, we're going to have the traditional picks you expect for this topic. Uh, my first pick, I'm going to pick a film, which I think tonally is really hard to get into. And then on the second, one, one, second watch, once you know how you're supposed to sort of like perceive everything. It's like, oh, this works a lot better for me. Uh, the film that also Boat, I know you love, uh, Todd Salon's is Happiness. Uh, I think this is an incredibly hard film to stomach. And it's, at least it was, it's, it's pitched me as like the darkest of dark comedies where everyone is deplorable and disgusting. And I went into it knowing that, and it just, I didn't, I didn't really understand. And then when I really like sat down and, and thought about like what it was to like what it was to me and how I sort of perceived it, and just it's 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 the, the it's the depravity of the, the average human, and seeing how a lot of people who we see as normal in our society and their own private lives how disgusting and horrifying they are, it's it grows in me a lot, and I think it's like this really interesting film that once you know what the film was really trying to say and how to set it up, it's fantastic. And Nazario agrees with me, so. I I mean, yeah, Nazario agrees with you, and that man thinks that uh, Babe Pig in the City is one of the top 10 greatest movies of all times. So there you go. Uh, happiness, 
Look, maybe it is the second watch is just going to make it click for me, but I I think happiness is just a it's a really well done movie on I think just that I, I just don't get the point of it. It is just so uncomfortable to a degree that just does not work for me whatsoever. Like it is, I agree. It is one of the most uncomfortable movies of all time. And there's just a point where it's just like, what are we doing here for me at least? Anyway. Scott, have you seen happiness? Uh, I haven't. I am surprised to see it show up here on this topic though, because I just have heard that it's just like, so upsetting that I can't, you know, imagine that it's something people want to run out and rewatch. But, um, you know, I, uh, will entertain Adelaide's perspective because I've never seen the movie. So that's fair. Uh, Dylan. No, this is one that I, I haven't seen yet just because I know that I'd need to be in the right mood to watch something really, uh, upsetting. So, and I haven't been in that mood recently. So yeah, I just haven't got around to it yet. That is fair. Okay, Scott, we're going to go back to you. What is your next pick? All right. I'm going to go recent movie. Uh, my second favorite movie of 2020 um, is a movie called Possessor, um, directed by Brandon Cronenberg, um, son of David Cronenberg. Um, and this is a really wild, like, body horror slash, like, cyberpunk um, sci-fi movie um, about this technology that gets invented where people can basically inhabit other people's bodies. Um, and... Andrea Riseborough plays like this assassin who is supposed to um, enter the body of this guy played by Christopher Abbott um, and assassinate basically this like tech mogul. Um, but it becomes this like fascinating struggle for like identity, like Andrea Riseborough's character, who's like this decorated assassin, is kind of starts losing her sense of self the more that she um you know infiltrates other people's bodies um christopher abbott is giving an amazing performance he's giving like three different performances because he has to play colin just the character colin the regular guy he has to play colin being inhabited by andrea riseborough's character and then he has to play colin when both personalities are like fighting each other because like literally there is like a war going on inside his body towards the end of the movie between the two you know, uh, two individuals like for control of his body. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating movie. Like I said, I think it's, it's, um, it's worth watching twice because first of all, because the story, you know, just has, um, you know, some confusing elements to it probably on the first watch. And in particular, I think the ending resonates really strongly when you can put all of the pieces together. Um, but also I think there's just a lot of, like I said, it's a very thematically rich movie. There's also a lot about like the way that corporate corporatization and like technology and everything contributes to us, like losing our sense of self and dehumanization. And um, it's also just like a really cool movie to look at. Like the color palettes are like really striking. Um, again, the way the scenes are shot when they're like, personalities are fighting each other inside um you know the bodies are like you know very inventive um i think it speaks a lot to brandon cronenberg as a stylist um which you would expect him to be given who his father is um but also i think he establishes himself here as like an exciting voice and filmmaker all his own so i highly recommend this movie all right uh, i haven't seen it yet dylan have you seen this one I have. I actually got to see it. Uh, I was fortunate enough to see it in theaters last year because uh, it was played for like a really short run at our theater here. And yeah, I really, really love this movie. Uh, I still need to see it the second time. I was a little bit distracted the first time I saw it because my brother nearly had an emergency in the theater. But uh, yeah, that's a story for another day. But <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, I really like this movie in terms of visually, like what uh, Scott was saying, one of the things that one of the most striking images that I thought this movie had was when they first show the process of her like transferring into the conscience of someone and just how they visualize like that whole process looked really really cool and I I think they had like a really low budget for this movie too so it was yeah. like it's really impressive like what they were able to accomplish here and yeah pretty good movie that's fair Adelaide you seen this one yet 
I have a fun story behind this. I watched it to write a paper about it for a horror class I was taking. I uh, still haven't written it because I was so like unimpressed and unaffected by the movie. I think it resided in the camp where there's a lot it could it could have done. And it was just, it, it didn't go far enough, really. I think it's a film that had so much promise and so much potential that sort of just, it wasted it on not really going like full send in, into the end of the topic. And I think the story is interesting in and of itself. I don't think it's executed in the best way possible. I think we're going to say on the, on the show a lot tonight. Uh, maybe it'll be better on a second watch. I don't think it will be, honestly, but there's always that chance. I just, Andrew Riseboro, great, is great. And the male lead is too, but that's really about it. That's fair. Okay. Uh, we're going to go back over to me. Uh, now, I said before, I didn't really pick surreal films, but this one, I think, at least fits the bill a little bit. Uh, this is a film I did not like when I first watched it, uh, but second watch, it a lot of the symbolism kind of came together for me, but I think it's also a film that even if you don't get or even care to understand the symbolism, I think the characters are just fun enough on their own. I'm going with a little film called Barton Fink. Uh, I think Barton Fink is a film uh, that has a lot going on. Uh, I think there's a lot about uh, Charlie Meadows, a lot of maybe surrealism is the wrong word to use, but there's at the very least, there's an atmosphere that certain things might not be what they seem. Uh, but Regardless, I, I think that this is a film that I once I kind of there there are just little things that I've noticed that I almost don't want to say because I, I don't want to you know spoil too much about them. Obviously it's an older movie, but I just think it's a film that has a lot of like different themes. Like th something I didn't pick up on is that like Barton talks like the whole movie about oh I want to like get in touch with the common man. And you really find the whole movie, he's just absolutely disrespecting everyone who he views as, like, the common man. And I think that is just very interesting. Uh, and I, there, there's just a lot going on. Um, I, I really enjoy this film. Totoro is phenomenal. The fact that he wasn't nominated. The fact that John Goodman wasn't nominated. Uh, th this film is excellent. Dylan, thoughts on Barton Fink? Uh, actually, I haven't seen it yet, so. That's fair. Uh, Spence? I don't like this really that much. Uh, it's just like, I don't know. I I don't really have words to describe it. I watch it, I watch it for Koho, and I'm like, hey, you should watch this thing. And I'm like, okay, I watched it, and it's there. And I'm just like, eh, whatever. Not my favorite. Maybe my least favorite, Cohen. No, it's not. It's like, it's like my bottom three, though. Uh, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I do... I can definitely see how this fits within the topic and I do leave open the possibility that I would like it more on the second watch, but I don't know. I just think I didn't get it the first time. Um, and usually I do with the Coens, but I don't know, maybe something about the like dark comedy and everything didn't work for me here. Although I think uh, that John Goodman is definitely very good in the movie. Um, I, I understand the praise for his performance. Um, it was just, Left me a little cold, surprisingly. Um, so I, I, I thought I would like it more. But again, maybe a second watch. We'll see. I'd give it a rewatch. Okay. Uh, so now we will go to Dylan. Um, just trying to make a decision here. Okay, I'll go with this one. All right, so one director that I'm quite fond of in terms of their work and not them as a person is Terry Gilliam. Uh, and so I'm going to go with 12 Monkeys for my next pick because it's uh, oftentimes the time travel, these types of time travel movies can be quite uh, disorienting or hard to follow and may take a couple watches. This one, from what I hear, I'm not a scientist, is pretty accurate to what uh, time travel would be like, at least in terms of following its own rules that it sets up in the movie. And I think Brad Pitt is phenomenal in this movie. This might be my favorite performance from him, honestly. Like, he fully just becomes that character. And, yeah, I think I think the twist at the end, even though I kind of see, you kind of start to see it coming, but you still hope that it doesn't happen because you really don't want it to. But, 
yeah, it's, I think this movie is really, really cool. And I just love its vision of the future. I think it's like really, really cool and unique. That's fair. Uh, I don't think I've actually seen this movie from beginning to end. I've seen about half of it, I think. And it was a long time ago, so I don't really remember too much about it. Uh, Adelaide, you seen 12 Monkeys? Uh, nope. And this movie sends me flashbacks back to 2020, so I don't want to relive those. Oh, yeah. Uh, Scott? <laughs> yeah, I really like this movie. It has also been a little while since I've seen it. Uh, I would definitely like to rewatch it because I have only seen it the once. And again, once you see the twist, it's like, oh, I, yeah, I, I want to go back and see how everything was put together. But I remember really liking it at the time. Um, so and, and that was, you know, years ago before I ever even was watching a lot of movies. So I'd probably like it even more nowadays. That's true. Okay, uh, so now we're going to go to Spence. I'm going to, once again, add some spice to the show. Because I think there's another way to interpret this. Uh, movies, but you watch the first time, and you're like, oh, this is dog shit. And eventually you sort of, like, warm up to that and accept the dog shit is like, ironic quality that you really enjoy watching. But the script is not going to make Bowman very happy. Or maybe Dylan, I don't know. We're both the same age. Uh, I'm going to talk about the great... Uh, Robert Rodriguez masterpiece The Adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl in 3D because let's be honest if we watched it as we were today we'd all fucking hate it with bad effects, bad acting, a weird story we, we wouldn't give a shit but you know what this is a lot of fun <laughs> I, lo- I love a lot, of, a lot of Rodriguez's family films and I think it's just that just like this really like rich universe of really cheesy dialogue an action that's like both great and bad at the same time. This is a film that I, I rewatched recently and like, oh, I'm probably gonna hate this. And no, I actually really enjoyed myself. It's a film I grew up with and a film that I'm happy to like keep growing with. On Letterboxd, there was a list made uh, that basically described this very specific type of like early 2000s film, like all the like early mid late 2000s films, family films that have like this type of aesthetic. And it was called Slime House. And I honestly think that is like the perfect name for like these types of movies. Uh, And in that, that is kind of the lens in which I view them. And honestly, these movies are absolutely just awful pulpy fun. Is like they they are nostalgia bombs if you grew up with them. They don't work for everybody, but in the same way that cheesy '80s horror movies don't work for everybody, or like '70s like exploitation like car Australian movies, whatever. Like there are just certain types of movies that are just made for like very specific like moments in time, and I have fun with this one. Is it good enough? But I have fun with it. Dylan, thoughts on the adventures of Shark Boy and Lava Girl? Uh, is it good? Probably not. Did I watch it an unhealthy amount of times as a kid? Yeah, absolutely. I even had they had it, uh, the option on the Blu-ray where you because the movie was shot in 3D. They had the option on the Blu-ray where you can like uh, turn on the 3D mode with like the blue and red like effects on it, and they would come with like these crappy like cardboard glasses that you put on, and it was just the worst. I remember watching it on this tiny little TV screen that I had and it was a great moment from childhood. But uh, yeah, I'm probably never going to watch it again though. (laughs) This is not one of the movies that I ever would have expected would have made this list. So props to you. Props to Adelaide for being unpredictable. I agree. Uh, Scott, you seem like the same big shark boy and lava girl fan i had the same thought as michael i was like yeah you're definitely referring to one particular movie here with this description but i really um, wasn't i was honestly just thinking about <laughs> well, what type of movie is death proof is what i was yeah, trying okay. to say okay um i actually this is not the robert rodriguez family film in 3d from the mid 2000s that i uh watched a lot as a child i don't think i've ever seen it actually to be honest with you but the other one i've seen that one a lot spike in 3d is a better movie so i thought this fit the topic 
That's fair. Cakes. My kid's 3D is better than Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Fan zone to come at me, Dylan. <laughs> uh, the, the best Spy Kids film is Spy Kids to the Island of the Lost Streams. Agree. Hard agree. God said heaven because he too is in, lives in fear of what he's created. Greatest <laughs> line ever uttered in any film ever. Uh, anyway, uh, we have two more slots left to fill. Uh, so, uh, Scott, you want to, we'll let you get a third pick in here. All right. Um, I'm kind of surprised nobody's brought up a Christopher Nolan movie yet, because I feel like he's one of the people who immediately comes to mind when you think of movies that um, you need a second watch for. So I'm going to pick my favorite one. It's probably no one else here's favorite one. It's probably no one else who's watching this is favorite one. Uh, but one of my favorite movies is Interstellar. And... Uh, I think that the movie is a masterpiece. This was the last Nolan movie that I I came to it late. I came to it last year, actually. Um, I, for whatever reason, just passed me by when it came out. But um, I was blown away. I was like speechless when I finished watching this because I think Nolan, for me as a filmmaker, the one thing he's been missing, although he is one of my favorite directors, no question, um, is emotion in some of his movies like i think i am just left a little bit cold at some of at the end of some of his movies like the prestige or inception and this movie just like fixes all of that um it is just like uh one of the most moving movies that i've seen and i do think second watch um definitely helps it because um especially those early scenes between coop and murph when you understand what is to come and you understand all that's going on with time in the movie um i think they just they hit different uh for lack of a better phrase when you go back and watch them um and i just think the movie is an emotional tour de force and again the way that like nolan who is so rigorous in the way that he explains every aspect of his world and like he just builds these really complex and um, world with very clear worlds with very cl clear rules the way that he kind of gets to the end of this movie and just throws his hands up and is like here's the one thing I've never been able to explain um, I don't know That's I find that really um, humbling and kind of amazing so um, I think Interstellar is one of the more beautiful movies I've ever seen and um, that alone makes it worth a rewatch but also um, you know I think you definitely get different layers out of it the second time because you have to figure out what's all going on the first time that's fair uh, I I like Interstellar more than the people who hate Interstellar but I hate Interstellar more than the people who like Interstellar um, I, I think this one is good I don't think it's great I don't think it's bad uh, I think there are some Really good things about it. It also is when Nolan really got into like this kind of exposition and philosophy as dialogue instead of like actually talking like humans do. I feel like some people like attribute it to Inception, but I don't think so. I think Interstellar is like where it started, and that's one of Nolan's biggest problems. Overall, it's good, not great. Uh, Dylan? Uh, this one, strangely enough, it was one that just kind of like passed me by. I never really <laughs> got around to watching it. But uh, I do admire uh, Christopher Nolan for how he, uh, how much like trust he puts into his audience when he, by making these movies that are like on such like a big scale and for like big audiences and like, but they're so like complex and like, confusing and he rarely ever goes it like kind of like david lynch to a lesser extent he rarely ever to, like explains a lot of it or what's like literally supposed to be happening to the audience he lets it you kind of like piece it together yourself uh so i find that admirable i haven't seen this movie though so i'll be quiet that's fair uh spence number one bad movie number two <laughs> doesn't fit this topic because honestly it's not even that confusing like there's there's nothing to gain from a second watch. I don't think there's anything that like adds to the experience. And number three, there's way better Nolan films. I don't love Memento. That's a better pick. Uh, Prestige, perfect pick for this. Even even Inception, I think is a simple enough movie. You could have picked it better than this. This is just a bad pick all around. Take it off the list. Give me fucking Spy Kids 3D. <laughs> 
No one here on that okay, well, the experience. That, but... Dylan, I'll let you get the last pick to round out the show. What do you want to take? Ooh, this is tough. Uh, I'll go with an animated movie. I'll go with uh, Perfect Blue by Satoshi Kon. Uh, this is a movie that I just watched uh, for the first time this year, and I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, it, a lot of people would know it as the movie that obviously inspired uh, Black Swan, which uh, it's weird that there were two Best Picture nominees in 2010 that were inspired by Satoshi Kon movies with this and Inception, uh, which is kind of strange. But uh, yeah, Perfect Blue is just uh, fantastic, I feel like. I love like how it's structured and like how it shows this like uh singers like descent into madness really and also like the music in it is actually like really good too like the song that they that she's singing with her group before she quits is like legitimately catchy like it was stuck in my head after just one watch and yeah i just yeah really love this movie and i i look forward to watching it multiple times more in the future that's fair um i'm of the opinion, uh, I didn't love Perfect Blue when I first saw it. I, I respected it more than I liked it. I'm not big on Satoshi Kon, but at the same time, I got the sense that I would like it more on a second watch. So that I now that I, so that I can at least get more of a grasp on it. So I agree with its spot on this list because I feel like a second watch would improve my enjoyment of the movie greatly. Uh, Spence, have you seen Perfect Blue? No, I mean, like, no. Okay, Scott. Yeah, yeah, this movie's great. I watched it for the first time this year as well, um, and it's crazy how like much this movie predicted like stan culture on the internet, uh, like before that was ever really a thing, like it, in the late '90s, and you know just the way that the people are talking about her on the message boards and stuff like that, and that kind of sets a lot of this into motion. Another movie about like losing your identity. Uh, uh, you know, struggling with all that, which is um, interesting. So I, yeah, this is a fascinating movie and uh, I would definitely like to rewatch it soon because it's super short. So it's an easy one to rewatch. That's fair. Uh, so yeah, that does wrap up the main portion of the show. Only thing we have left is to talk about movie of the month. Last week, we're talking about it. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Uh, I don't believe any of you have talked about it on Logged It this month. Okay, nope. so uh, yeah, just uh, Scott, thoughts on Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Uh, yeah, shout out to all the people who voted for this, because I didn't, and it wasn't something that I would have thought that I would be interested in, to be honest, but uh, this movie's fantastic. Um, I was surprised how much I liked this. Um, I think I was surprised most by how like grounded the movie is. Um, like obviously, you know, it's about pod people to some extent, but like the first hour or so of the movie is really just kind of like a procedural almost of like these people just walking around trying to figure out what's going on. And the characters are really well drawn. Like all four of the main characters, you know, Donald Sutherland and um, Leonard Nimoy, Jeff Goldblum, and then Brooke Adams, who I mentioned before, I think they do a good job of setting up all those characters before they actually get you into the the horror stuff so that you care about what's going on. It also fits really well, like in the seventies, which I mean, it's a, it's a remake obviously, but it fits really well in the seventies because it is so much about paranoia. And that was like a huge theme of seventies movies with like the parallax view and three days of the condor and all these, you know, other um, paranoia where, where paranoia was kind of at the heart of um, all of them. And uh, particularly about like surveillance state in those movies, but still, I think it fits um and just super haunting like in the last third of the movie obviously um apparently the ending is like kind of famous but like i don't know i'd never seen like that final moment before um in any clips or anything like that I, if i had it never registered um with me but man you talk about like a last moment of a movie where like the credits roll and there's just complete silence in the credits too which i thought was effective um and you just sit there and you're like whoa um so yeah I, the the movie's great um it has some interesting themes going on very stylish it's great special effects like all the stuff with the flower like 
birthing the like fetuses was was crazy like i couldn't believe i was seeing that in a 70s movie i think i'm really into 70s horror now especially after watching this because like obviously halloween and black christmas and the wicker man and phantasm like all these movies are really great um and yeah so i, I thank you to the people who voted for this because i wouldn't have watched it otherwise yeah uh adelaide this is a movie I'm probably going to speak the least about because I, I understand it was a good movie. It just really didn't hit me in like any strong way. I think I just honestly just watched it on a bad day. I think the effects are great. I think, I, like Scott pointed out, the birthing scene and everything and the way that it's shown to like expand. I think it's, it might not be the first there's scene I remember where just, it's, I saw it growing and I'm like, holy shit, this is incredible. Uh, and I really like Arnold Sutherland and Jeff Goldblum. But I think in general, it's a film that I think I'll like a lot more on the second watch. Just this first time, sort of like numb to it. That's fair. Uh, Dylan. Yeah, the real, the, I really enjoyed this movie. The practical effects were just, I, I love like watching like these old horror movies from like the 70s and 80s and the best ones where just how they like managed to shoot around everything practically. And it, just the way they did it with this one with like, yeah, that one scene where donald sutherland falls asleep and all of the sort of replica replicant monster thingies are getting birthed out of the flowers like legitimately terrifying which i was not expecting this movie to be all that much uh for some reason but yeah i i think this movie also utilizes silence really well uh like there's a scene towards the end where it shows like a bunch of people just walking emotionlessly through these hallways. And normally you'd expect with that much people crowded in one space, there's like this like hum of just random human voices here and there. But when you take that all away and everyone's just emotionless and silently walking through, there's something like very eerie and creepy about it that I thought was like super effective. And yeah, I, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed this mo- this one because i figured i'd like it but i didn't know i didn't expect to love it as much as i did that's fair uh well anyway uh that does conclude the show for this week uh next week the topic as i recall is if i can find it here uh in so- ensemble movies Ensemble movies uh, will be the topic for next week. So if you want to be on that, please be sure to message either myself or Tim Burkala. I'll probably have the poll for uh, Movie of the Month coming out soon. But if you want to be on Ensemble movies, uh, be sure to let one of us know. Regardless, thank you to Scott. Thank you to Dylan. Thank you to Adelaide. Thank you to everyone at home for watching. This has been Multiplex Logged It. I'm your host, Kevin Lobo Boatman. See you next week. In case I don't see you. Good afternoon. Good evening. Ah!